Welcome to Strip Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here together for the first of a nine-part series as we ask, what is poetry? This coming from John Hall Wheelock, and it is a text that I'm assuming you don't have, so I am going to do my best to sort of recap what is in the text as we ask these questions, because I thought that this might prove a fun, entertaining, useful, and productive type of discussion here on BookTube. Uh, as we, as a channel, Strip Cover Lit, often go through reviews, and many other channels, though many other channels are less review-heavy than, than we are, they are, neither are they heavy in the questions of foundation in the literary field. What is poetry? How do we define poetry? Uh, what is the difference, as chapter one here asks, video one in this series, poetry and prose, the essential difference. What is the difference between poetry and prose? And to get into this, I thought that it might prove useful to simply read the opening paragraph, which is as such. What is poetry? What is prose? Is there any way of defining the essential difference between the two categories into which we have divided literature? It is, the more, it is the more obvious difference, the difference in form, that gets us off to a wrong start. As the schoolboy said, poetry is written in verse, prose is written in plain English. Yet, certainly, the difference in form is not the essential difference. There are passages in the King James Version of the Bible that can't be cast out of the category of poetry merely because they are written in prose. Yeats, open, Yeats opens the Oxford Book of Modern Verse with a passage from Walter Pater. The prose poem is an accepted, if momentarily unfashionable, genre. The verse, on the other hand, that comes to you over the radio celebrating the virtues of breakfast food will not, for all its rhyme and rhythm, fit into any conceivable definition of poetry. Wheelock then disintegrates the notion that poetry is defined by rhythm, by the deployment of rhythm, as all skilled orators will make rhythm of any speech, and the best poets force change of cadence in their reader's delivery. We can see this oftentimes, someone, someone such as Barack Obama, for example, Barack Obama spoke with a lot of rhythm, even if some of that rhythm was broken with his famous uhs and ums. Uh, we are, uh, you know, those things that he threw in. The reason he was deploying that verbal malady, the uh or the um, was to keep a rhythm, was to keep a rhythm in his delivery of the speech. Someone, uh, and I'm just going with speakers here, politicians speak um, quite often, so I think that there are people with which we are normally familiar. Bill Clinton, when he speaks publicly, speaks with his hands a lot, because you can see him keeping that metronome going. Uh, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, Right. So he sort of keeps a rhythm while he's speaking. On the other hand, many of the best poets, Emily Dickinson, for example, no, Emily Dickinson is not a good example. Charles Bukowski may be a better example, force us to change the cadence of our speech. Emily Dickinson wrote in a lot of uh, very set cadence and very set patterns. Um, going back to Shakespeare, for example, wrote in a set pattern. But many of today's... Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath, to my ear, wrote more with the rhythm of cadence than with a specific set of syllables in mind. That is, that a set of syllables might prove more or less astounding to the ear when paired with other words and the way they fall. So for me, a, a way of pointing to this is that in French, when a word ends with a consonant, you do not pronounce it. You skip the last letter of the word. 
uh, and this helps with the delivery in French of the word that proceeds from there. Um, and that is one of the tools with which the French language sounds so pretty. Poets will capitalize on something very similar when writing by using their ear towards the syllables at play, the phonemes being deployed, not simply the number of claps to the syllable. Um, moving on, because of the false start, Wheelock wonders whether the ethereal spirit of the text can serve as the poetically defined, the poetic defining mechanism. But anyone who has read Dickinson to Bukowski to Whitman to Shakespeare can tell you that there is no ultimate poetic spirit. That all of these different writers write in their own spirit, not a spirit that is channeling their brilliance. So we are left to question ultimately, if not what is the difference between poetry and prose, then take it back a step, and what is poetry? And Wheelock is sure to point out Frost's definition of poetry, which is that poetry is what gets lost in translation. Very cheeky, Mr. Frost, very cheeky indeed. In that same paragraph, Wheelock tells us, but as Mallarmé has told us, a poem is not made of ideas or of feelings, but of words. You cannot translate the words of a poem in such a way as to translate their meaning and yet reproduce their original rhythm and color, their identical associative and oral, value, oral values. All those nuances of sound and of symbolism that are a poem's very essence. Moreover, the syntactical order in which words are arranged varies from language to language, and the overall effect of the words in the original may not be preserved when they are rearranged in the order imposed upon them by translation. Also, there are words in each language that have no equivalent in another. The French have no word for home. There is no verb in English that is the exact counterpart of the German verb lauschen nor does the German gucken adequately render the implications of the English verb to peer. Um, this all leads Wheelock to posit, coming on page 20, a poem will result when the genius of a language, its words, their sound, and their sense, offers the genius of a poet an opportunity to perform a miracle. That masterpiece of coincidence that achieved miracle, the poem, with its unique syllabic patterns, its unique consonantal and vowel music, is seemingly inevitable cadences, partly the result of skill, partly the result of sheer good luck, is not translatable. Still, this gives us more of a guideline for telling when a poem might be authentically poetic, more than giving us a rubric for poetry. After all, if rubrics included things like genius and miracle, a box for genius, a box for miracle on the rubric, I might have gotten more A's in school, but I did not. So. I ask of you, I beg of you, to start this series off strong. Uh, what is poetry? In the comments section below, try to craft some definition that you believe defines poetry. As for my wily self, I do not know at this time when questioning these things that I could come up with a substantial definition for poetry. But I am hoping that we lock through this series can help me to understand what I might consider a poem and can hopefully more thoroughly describe what it is that he considers a poem and hopefully these 
definitions of poetry that he falls back on, and the one that he will build through the argument of this text are stronger than the sort of ethereal definition of poetry which he has already provided. So that's it. That is it for part one of a nine-part series as we journey through John Hall Wheelock's What is Poetry? I hope to see you here for the next installment, part two, which comes to us by the way of this title, A True Poem is a Way of Knowing. And I am excited to see where that chapter takes us. So if you liked this video, hit the like button because it really helps us out here on the channel. If you would like to maintain um, your integrity by following us on this journey, be sure that you are subscribed. Maybe hit the bell for notifications. And if you would like to help us create more content here on Strip Cover Lit, there is a link as always to our Patreon to be found in the description below.